Hey everyone, this is Andy from the OETC 17 Ed Tech Talk Live presenter, and with me is uh, one of the keynotes from which we'll be presenting on Wednesday, February 15th from 9 to 10.30, and it's Freddie Lajavardi. And Freddie is a nationally recognized STEM educator, so he's a high school teacher, and he's the subject of some really awesome movies. One, the critically acclaimed documentary, Underwater Dreams, which I'll have him talk about, and a major motion picture called Spare Parts, as well as uh, an IMAX uh, documentary that's coming out. So, uh, Freddie, thank you so much for joining me, and I think maybe my first question to you is, gosh, tell me about the movies... Uh, the documentary, Underwater Dreams, and uh, how does that kind of give an overview of, of the inspirational work you've been doing? Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, uh, it's kind of amazing just thinking about the, the fact that I can actually say there's three films made about us, and um, it's kind of strange, but um, I guess I'm getting used to it. Uh, <laughs> the first film to come out was uh, Underwater Dreams. Uh, it was actually being filmed simultaneously as the time that Spare Parts, which is the Hollywood-based film uh, that was uh, being filmed at the same time. So the documentary came out first, and it was extraordinary. Um, it really opened up a lot of people's eyes on the plight of undocumented students in the United States and, and what they can accomplish if, if given the right you know, opportunities. Um, it, it, it really uh, opened a lot of eyes of people who might not have known about the uh, situation and the plight that the students were in. and. Uh, it may have changed, in many cases, you know, that I saw, it changed uh, the perception of how they viewed undocumented students in the United States. And it's not just about the undocumented students, it's also about low socioeconomic students and uh, education in general, um, uh, that the United States is, is, you know, probably at a turning point where STEM education is becoming a focus, and we were kind of uh, ahead of the curve on doing what we termed as extracurricular STEM, um, so we basically did STEM after school because, you know, we kind of felt like there was a need to try to make STEM fun. And the traditional sense in high schools, it just didn't seem to be doing it. So basically we wanted to play with the kids after school with science to show them how pragmatic it was and useful it was. We had no idea uh, how far this was going to take us. We just wanted to show them that science wasn't a boring subject. And so the documentary goes about, you know, explaining how, our, you know, we progressed in our in our quest to try to get these kids exposed to, um, you know, an extracurricular STEM competition, and uh, the rest is history from there. The movie, uh, the Hollywood movie, Spare Parts, is, you know, like they say, it's based on a true story. So they took the two teachers, myself and uh, Alan Cameron, and combined us into one character and created George Lopez. So he plays uh, a combination of myself and Alan. They used each of our names as his name. So my first name is uh, George's first name in the movie, Freddie, and Alan's last name, Cameron. So George's character is Freddie Cameron, uh, in honor of the teachers. Um, about 60% of what you see in, in how the teacher gets involved in the lives of the students is probably accurate. Um, the, and, and the backstory as well. You know, there's certain parts. I don't want to ruin it for anyone, but keep in mind that it's Hollywood and they have their formula for what they think is going to be a success and not necessarily in line with reality. So <laughs> when people see that, that movie, keep in mind that 50 to 60 percent of what the teacher's going through is, is what we went through. And then as far as the students, I'd say it's closer to 80 percent. Um, a lot of what they went through is, is normally dramatic in their life, and so it was not that difficult to uh, leave it as it is because of the story was you know, capturing uh, everyone's attention. So that pretty much is, is the same. It'd be little things, like when a student did something, it might have been after high school versus that in the movie they showed him doing it in high school. So little little things like that. Um, and both of them opened up uh, with a lot of people uh, interested in, in, in seeing the story. The documentary had a much wider appeal because it was technically a, a educational documentary. And so it even got the chance to play at the White House um, um, for Robotics Week. So it, it's been used in, in conferences across the country, um, in school board uh, conferences, um, teacher conferences. Um, some political organizations have used it on both sides uh, for whatever their goal was. So it's a film that's really reached a broad appeal, and uh, I think because 
because it touches so many topics, it, it's, it's used broadly. Uh, the Hollywood movie didn't reach as many people, um, but it did do what I think it was meant to do. It was never meant to be an Oscar-winning film or anything like that. It was just meant to just be a movie that told a story. And I think it really captured what it's like for a teacher to get involved in the lives of students to help get them to achieve. Now, the third film, which I haven't seen the effects of yet, is an IMAX film coming out, I believe, in the middle of this month, uh, and it's called Dream Big. And we were approached by IMAX because they were making a film in conjunction with Bechtel Corporation to promote STEM education, primarily in civil engineering. Now, the problem was they were having difficulty trying to find things that they thought would motivate young people. And so they threw in some other stories of young people doing incredible things, and they asked us if they could show our story of how we beat MIT in that underwater competition uh, as one of the vignettes that they have that they're gonna intersperse with covering the wonders of the world. Um, so it remains to be seen uh, how, what the effect is of, of that film is, but they're also producing a lot of educational uh, lesson plans and material that go along with the film. Um, and from what they explained to me, the IMAX people, uh, they say that typically one of their films reaches approximately 20 million people. So this film may not be in a lot of theaters, but it has extremely long run times. It may be at Arizona, uh, excuse me, science centers across the country for years. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm imagining some side effect is going to come as a result of this that you know will be able to be measurable. But uh, for the time being, I, I can't predict exactly what that's going to be. Um, so I hope that explains the three movies. <laughs> it does. It does, and actually explains um, certainly part of your your background and, and history. And you mentioned the the F word, fun. Is that kind of where you started from? Is is that the genesis of of, of basically your work? Is is thinking of ways to make science, which is typically uh, you know a boring subject. And and I've as a former elementary teacher, you know, my passion was social studies, and I always thought that as well. That that it's often such a boring thing. Is is that where things started? Is how can I make this fun and relevant to kids? Yeah, uh, you know, as a young teacher, um, you don't know exactly what to do, and you're told here's the syllabus and here's the state standards, and you're going to be evaluated, and you better do all these things, and so many students better pass, and so you have all these things that you're worried about, and you're afraid to do anything other than what's essential, and and what, if you notice what's missing in there is that that F word, the fun, and so it became very obvious to me that I wasn't connecting with the kids because I was so worried about trying to meet all the standards and worried about being evaluated and didn't want to take any risks. And it got to the point where I wasn't having fun. Uh, I was questioning whether or not I made the right choice of being a teacher until I decided, look, after school, we could do whatever we want. So we kind of got together and, you know, got the kids to show up after school and had said, hey, what do you guys want to do? And we did things like at first, it was science fair projects, so we had a small group of people because you're only going to get the kid that's kind of the nerdy kid that wants to do the science fair project. But then when we started doing things like launching pumpkins with you know gravity-operated catapults or trebuchets, then we started drawing in more people, and then we started building electric vehicles, and you know that drew in even more people. So by the time we got to robots, we had kind of reached a critical mass of a cross-section of the population of the school so that it was... You know, making a, it, it was satisfying to know that we were reaching not just the nerdy kids, but basically what would end up being a cross section of the population. So that's what made for me uh, teaching fun because we used to joke that any time it was time to go to class, that school was getting in the way of our education. But um, as a as a whole, what it really did was show what you were doing in class, how it was relevant. So, for instance. If we're dealing with a robot that's pushing our robot around, and the kids say, well, how come we can't push them around? We'll say, well, you know, the coefficient of friction between the carpet and our tires isn't you know, high enough, and our transmissions might not be the right gear ratios. And so then they ask, these are the million-dollar questions. Well, how do we increase our coefficient and change our gear ratios so that we can push them? Now, if I would have walked into a classroom and said, okay, today we're going to talk about coefficient of friction, one kid might be interested. But when a whole team lost the competition because of it, now the whole team cares what coefficient of friction is, and they're asking me to explain it to them. 
so that's kind of the difference of you know getting it and making it relevant versus just lecturing about it and so once you create a demand for the information then you have a captive audience and when you have a captive audience you can teach in the traditional format so that's what the, the thing was that we really observed that they were now asking for you know I want to do this for a living what classes do I need uh, and they say things like well you know do I have to take physics I say, yeah you have to take physics you got to take calculus you're probably going to need differential equations and linear algebra and so now they're pursuing those things because they realized how much fun they had building the robots and they want to do that for a living so in order to do that they have to take these classes so you know they they're actually in charge of their education rather than being dictated their education that leads me to my next question with there it seems to be there's a renewed focus and maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong there but it seems like stem and steam coding robotics and you know now we've got the new science standards that have come out um what are you looking towards as far as exciting new trends uh to kind of power the future for science education and, and other subjects as well well i think in general um the way that information is changing so rapidly and how it's going to change even faster in the future. And I mean, information probably in, in the majority of the subjects. I mean, history can only go so fast, so I don't know if history would change that much. But as far as math and the application of math and engineering and, you know, all the other courses that are being introduced like coding, because coding didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago and 99.9% .9 of the high schools in the United States, where now it's becoming a, an embarrassment if you don't offer coding. The direction that the schools are going is that they have to be able to create students that can solve problems. So the idea of basically following a recipe and teaching how to educate, you know, in a, a subject, those days I think are disappearing because people are discovering or rediscovering that human beings are natural learners. And the public school system, the way it's been set up for the last maybe 30 to 50 years, has been an industrialized method. It's one size fits all. And that's not the way that the real world works. The other problem is, is when you have that one-size-fits-all method, you kill any of the inspiration and motivation that the students may have. So what I see happening, in a, in a probably more abstract way of explaining it is, what's missing in public education, what seems to be starting to come back, is inspiring and motivating the teachers and inspiring and motivating the students. If you have those two key components, then all the other things like the standardized tests and whatever, those will take care of itself. It's the problem that we've been facing that things like the standardized test have been the point of education. And I don't know about you, but when I think about education, the last thing I want to focus on is taking a standardized test. I'm curious about how I'm going to find my place in this world and where do I fit. That's, that's the kind of thing you've got to try to convince the students that this is what you should be focusing on. And basically, there's two kinds of people in the future, those that are relevant to the economy and those that aren't. And in order to be relevant to the economy, you need to do two things, be creative and solve problems. And this is even true in industries today. You know, we hear lots of talk about we're bringing all back the, the coal industry and all this stuff and, 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 and manufacturing. You know, the biggest opponent of that is, is uh, automation. And the problem is, is robots are taking a lot of people's jobs. So the example I use with students is for a kid who's being, you know, uh, give me a hard time about why he should learn anything, I'll say, okay, well, you know, imagine driving up to a McDonald's and instead of a kiosk with a speaker, you have a big giant iPad that you can touch what you want, what, what do you want on your sandwich, what do you don't want, and then when you're done, you run your little credit card through there, and then the drinks are automatically filled up by a machine, and they said, oh, I've seen those things. Yeah, okay, so you've seen that. You ever watch anyone cook a hamburger? You know, it's 30 seconds on one side, 30 seconds on the other. Does a person need to do that, or could that be a robot? And imagine if you had a McDonald's replaced with robots. What argument could you provide the owner uh, to not use robots when the opposite argument is a person's going to need training time, a person's going to need time off, a person's going to need insurance, a person's going to want $15 an hour. If an owner is faced with those kind of things, what direction do you think they're going to go? And then the kid will say, well, where are all the people going to work? I go, that's why you need an education. It should not be your aspiration to grow up to do what a machine is going to replace what you're doing. You need to figure out how you're going to be able to continue to solve problems and be creative. And so I tell them, in their education, that's what you should focus on. And I think a lot of the things that are coming across in many of the school districts across the country is 
maybe they didn't think of it exactly the way I described it, but I think the courses are kind of leading people in those directions. I mean, coding by its nature is problem solving. Mathematics by its nature is problem solving. So education is kind of rediscovering what it means to use those, but not just do them as an exercise in, you know, hypothetical things. Actually applying it to real life will make it relevant to the students. And I think that's where um, the inspiration, motivation, and the new focus on STEM needs to be going. It's trying to make it real. Um, the other thing you got to keep in mind is you're dealing with students that are growing up in the YouTube generation. You can't take 30 to 45 minutes to explain a concept. You got to figure out how to teach on a YouTube format until you can hook them to the point where they themselves choose to spend 45 minutes solving a problem. So it's kind of the other way around. You have to get the students to lead themselves in the education because then you're going to have the success. If you're the one doing the pulling, you're not going to be as successful. So hopefully I explain what I, what I see coming you know, in education and how I think it's sort of heading in the right direction anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think um, you know, one of the ways that it's, it's been framed to me is kind of you know, we're, we're, we're digitizing education almost like music was digitized where it can be kind of anytime, anywhere type of exactly. learning. It's you know, people have asked me, you know, what about teachers? And I said, well, teachers aren't exempt from this. I mean, if you look at how many online classes there are, that's a threat to teachers if you're going to this as a career. So what's going to make or what's going to be the, the role of a teacher in the future? You've got to focus on those two things I said, creative and solving problems. So where does that fit in? You're basically talking about human characteristics, right? Mm -hmm. A neurotypical person, a normal person, can pretty much learn whatever he wants to learn, really without the help of a person, except for maybe once in a while there's a concept that he might need some explaining with. The role of human teachers in the future are going to be working with people who have difficulty in those subjects because it's a human being that can determine why another human being is having difficulty and how you might modify the instruction in order to get that person to get past that obstacle. So maybe... You know, uh, uh, people who have trouble with math, they'll have a human teacher, but the people that don't have trouble with math, they'll do it online. Maybe the people who have trouble with science will have a human teacher, and the people that don't have trouble with science will do it online. One of the reasons why everything's going online is it's cheaper, it's more cost-effective. You can go faster. You, know, you don't have to wait for the rest of the class. Um, like I said, education is kind of in a revolution, and in some way, education doesn't realize it's in the middle of this revolution. And I'm kind of curious to see what happens when everyone realizes that, hey, this is going on and we got to figure out how to be a part of it. I mean, just for Arizona State University alone, they offer 70 online degrees, 70. Wow. So, you know, there are some places that are getting the drift of this and there's other places that are still the traditional industrialized age of teaching, you know. So it's, it's just a matter of uh, time and being able to produce results. If you can produce students that are successful in the real world, then I think that schools will figure out that formula and keep doing it. So what are your um, upcoming projects or ideas that you've got going forward? Well, right now, as far as uh, with my robotics team, we are uh, gearing up for the 2017 first robotics competition uh, season. It's, we're in the fourth week of a six-week build session to try to build a robot to accomplish a series of tasks that was introduced in this introductory video. Um, it's basically picking up wiffle balls from different locations and shooting them at targets uh, so that they can score points. That's the basic rundown of it. Um, we're also uh, in a year-long, and this is a several-year-long project, of continuing to build an autonomous underwater robot. So this is basically an underwater robot we stick in this giant pool, and it has to navigate and, and you know do all these different things underwater. It takes place in... Uh, San Diego at the U.S. Naval Base at Point Loma, and um, it's a six million gallon pool, so it's where the Navy tests a lot of their equipment. And so we're competing against uh, 40 universities from 12 countries, and there's only three high schools to participate. And remember, you can't drive this robot. You have to put it in the water, and it's operating for 30 minutes by itself. So you have all kinds of sensors and kinds of navigation equipment. We're just trying to get our students exposure to what we think is coming down the line. I mean, you're already seeing autonomous cars on the road. Somebody has to program those autonomous cars. So this is an idea of why we're pursuing the autonomy aspect of robotics, because that's where the future is. Um, I'll know that we've achieved
achieved uh, critical mass on autonomous vehicles and implementing it in society when I can call Pizza Hut and a van drives over to my house with an oven built in and cooking the pizza on the way, text me when the pizza is delivered to the door and I just walk outside, run my credit card through it and pick up my pizza. Uh, when that happens, I think everyone's going to uh, realize that we're there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, can you give me a preview of your presentation for OETC without giving too much away? Yeah, uh, basically, uh, the, the, my presentation goes through the story of what I discovered when I first entered education and my disillusion with it and what I did to try to find my place in the world of education and still meet my obligations as a teacher, but also meet my obligations as a human being that wants to be inspired and motivated myself and excited and being able to pass that on to students. And I found a way to balance both, and I explained that in my presentation. And um, really, all of it was trial and error and chance and happened to be at the right place at the right time with the right students. And uh, still pinching myself that I'm in this position. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things I, I look to to try to get an understanding or a handle of what's going on is um, I read um, uh, Thomas Friedman's book, The Earth is Flat, and he goes around and interviews all these CEOs from companies around the world and asks them this one question, when did you realize that the world was flat? And flat referencing the fact that you had internet access and can do anything you want. And so I asked myself that same question, and the question was answered by when we were able to beat MIT because we had access to any kind of information that they could get because of the internet. So that's when the playing field became level. You just have to know what questions to ask. Uh, the other books that I've read that I think have kind of helped explain why we've been successful is um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, Tipping Point, mm -hmm. you know, the reference to 10,000 hours in 10 years. Yeah. So roughly at about that time is when we started having success. We kind of figured out what to do, and we had enough tools in our arsenal to help the students break through those barriers that were holding them back. So that's kind of what I go through in my explanation and my presentation. Um, and I'm trying not to tell any more because I will give away <laughs> okay. more if I keep talking. <laughs> okay. Um, well, Freddie, it was great talking with you. And one of the things I noticed as you were talking, you used the word us and we and fun as well. And I think uh, those are key ingredients, I think, going forward with, with education. And, and, and your story is really inspirational. I'm looking forward to, to seeing your presentation and learning more. But yeah, the reason I use those words is because I don't have any choice. I can't do any of this stuff by myself without the help of all the people that have learned or have the talents that my talent is pulling everyone together. If you're going to give me any credit for that, that I, I found that out from one of Malcolm Gladwell's books, too. I'm a connector um, and part salesman. I doubt that I'm a maven because no one copies my dress style, so I haven't <laughs> achieved that that level. But as far as the, the, the salesman and uh, the connector, I think I'm those two. So, yeah, I mean, there's no way I'd be in this situation without the help of all the people that have been involved. I just happen to be the face that gets the, the credit. So I have to use we. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I think also those are powerful words just about education in general is that really – we don't work in silos, or at least we shouldn't, and we reaching out and connecting and, and with, with what you're talking about with your work, I think that's, that's what it's all about. Well, thank you. All right, Freddie, I'll see you in uh, Columbus in a couple weeks, in a week. Okay, well, take care. All right, you too. Thank you, Freddie. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.